today we're going to review some of the labs from AP Chemistry. Now there's no specific required labs, but there are certain labs that pop up frequently in um, the actual exam at the end of the year. So I'm going to just very briefly go over um, some of the labs that I do in my class and um, how you might see questions from the exam. Okay, so the first type of lab you might see is uh, percent composition. Um, percent composition or combustion analysis are frequently asked. Um, so you might have to do an experiment where um, maybe you have a hydrocarbon, like CXHY, and you're combusting it. So you're reacting it with oxygen in the air, burning it, and it will form carbon dioxide and water. Um, if you have some kind of tool that can measure the amount of carbon dioxide and the amount of water that's produced, you can work backwards to find um, the carbon, because all of the carbon from the compound winds up in carbon dioxide, and all of the hydrogen from the compound winds up in water. Um, so that would be a combustion analysis um, based off of the amounts of carbon and hydrogen produced. But you could also do an experiment where you're looking for the percentage composition of elements in a compound. Um, so something like um, reacting a copper compound, CUXCLY, and reacting it with aluminum wire. That's um, a common lab experiment where we don't know the ratio of copper to chlorine. Well, when you react it, the aluminum replaces the copper in the reaction, so the copper winds up on its own and you're left with aluminum chloride. And the aluminum chloride is aqueous and the copper is solid, so you can filter out the copper. And remember, anytime we filter out a solid, we always need to uh, filter, rinse with deionized water to make sure all of the other stuff gets completely dissolved. And then you want to dry it, and you want to dry it to a constant mass so we know that all of the water has evaporated. Um, from there, you can use that um, amount of solid copper to work backwards. Um, whatever your total amount of solid that you had of the whole compound to begin with, you can subtract then to find the amount of chlorine. And from there, you can get a percentage. Another variation on percent composition is empirical formula of a hydrate. So let's say, for example, um, let's use that copper uh, chloride example. Let's say you found that it was CuCl2. But you also know that uh, copper chloride compounds form hydrates. And we don't know the formula for the hydrate. Remember that hydrates have a dot in the middle, and um, there's some number of waters in the crystal. So because it's a hydrate, what you can do is you can dehydrate it by heating it. You know, typically you would use um, like a Bunsen burner in a crucible or you could heat it on a hot plate. But the goal would be to then separate the copper chloride solid from the water vapor that's going to evaporate and leave. Um, from there you can, you can measure the mass of copper chloride remaining. And you want to make sure it's a constant mass, so you keep heating it until the solid stays the same mass, you know all of the water has left. Um, and then you can um, subtract from the original total mass to find out how much that was water. So then you'll have grams of both of those substances and you can convert to moles and do a mole ratio to find the empirical formula. Um, and so that's a really good application of empirical formulas in the lab. Another experiment that pops up sometimes is flame test or atomic emission spectra. I would say this experiment is a little bit more rare to see on the AP exam, but um, when you have, um, I'm going to use a Bohr model, when you have electrons in an atom, so let's say I have lithium here, um, and you expose it to some energy source. So maybe you uh, burn it in a flame. Um, or you could use electricity, pass electricity through it. Um, but whenever the atom is gaining uh, energy, and it has to be a, you know, sufficient energy, it will move the electrons to a higher energy level. But that becomes really unstable, so then it jumps back down to a lower energy level and releases the extra energy as light. So um, typically we say that um, 
energy that's in the UV or visible spectrum has enough energy to cause those electronic transitions. Um, if you have a flame test then and you're burning these metal atoms, um, they could have different colors. And you'll see that like lithium is a bright red. Um, you don't need to know any of the colors. You just need to know that the, um, the justification there, the explanation for why this is happening is that the electrons are changing energy levels and the excess energy is emitted as light when the electrons jump back down to a lower energy level. Um, if you have the correct tools, you could then take that light and use a prism and split it up into the different wavelengths. Um, so hydrogen, I believe, has four um, different wavelengths that show up very frequently when hydrogen, um, you add enough energy to cause those electronic transitions. So each um, element will have its own pattern, which we call the atomic emission spectrum. And um, if you do see this on the test, it will typically be a question about the light. Um, so you could be given a wavelength and asked about the energy, or you could be given the energy and asked about the wavelength, or vice versa. The equations are E equals HV and C equals lambda V, and those are on your formula sheet. Um, C is the speed of light and H is Planck's constant. Another experiment that pops up is um, comparing the physical and chemical properties of different solids. You should be able to distinguish um, ionic solids, metallic solids, um, covalent, but we want to be specific with covalent. Uh, we want to know if it's a polar covalent or a nonpolar covalent, and then a network covalent or a giant covalent, it's sometimes called. Um, so ionic compounds, the things, that, the properties that you could test for for an ionic compound is um, solubility in water. Ionic compounds are soluble in water, and then they will typically conduct electricity in water as well. Um, and they will conduct uh, in when it's dissolved or melted, because then those ions are free to move. If it, you have a metallic substance, it will not be soluble in water. Uh, not soluble. Um, it will conduct electricity as a solid. When you're looking at covalent compounds, um, polar covalent compounds will be soluble in water, but they will not conduct electricity because they don't have those free ions. Um, Nonpolar molecules are not soluble in water and they will not conduct electricity. Um, network covalent are strange. Really with network covalent solids, you want to know um, Silicon compounds typically form network covalent. Um, carbon um, by itself typically forms uh, network covalent. So things like diamond or graphite. And really, if you know those two examples, you'll be set. So like silicon dioxide or another silicon compound will form a giant covalent um, or a graphite. Graphite, okay. Um, and in terms of their properties that will help you distinguish this from the other covalent compounds is that network covalent will have a much, much higher melting point. Um, now covalent polar or nonpolar will tend to have the lower, lowest melting points because they only have those London dispersion, maybe some dipole-dipole interactions. Um, network covalent will have much, much higher melting points because they're um, connected by a whole bunch of covalent bonds. Um, so those are some of the ways that we can distinguish with um, tests for those different solids, so solubility in water, uh, conductivity in water are melted, um, and then um, melting point would be another one that could possibly pop up to distinguish. Another lab that pops up really frequently is chromatography. So usually you'll talk about paper chromatography, but you could have thin layer as well. Um, or column chromatography, but those are more rare. Uh, so you'll typically have your stationary phase, which is the paper or the um, TLC plate, but um, you'll have a solid um, stationary phase, it doesn't move. 
And then you'll have some kind of solvent, which is the mobile phase. So the solvent is going to travel up the stationary phase. Then you have the substance that's going to be um, tested and that's going to start above the level of the solvent. So when the solvent moves up the paper, it's going when it hits that solute, that uh, substance that you're testing for, it's going to travel with it. And when you're analyzing uh, chromatography paper, you're going to measure the distance that the substance traveled compared to the distance that the solvent traveled, and that's called the RF. Um, so the uh, solute to the one particular compound over the solvent is the RF value. And um, you would measure each thing separately. And the one that is furthest up the paper will have the strongest attractions to the solvent. The one that is lowest down has the weakest attra attractions to the solvent. Now let's talk about molar volume of a gas or any really gas evolving reaction. One way that you can do gas evolving reactions is by collecting it over water. So if you have a tube that's filled completely with water and you perform your reaction and when it produces a gas, the gas is going to travel to the top of the tube and it will displace the water out into some kind of container. It will displace the water. So you're left with a space with just gas and a space with the water because the gas travels to the top, it's the least dense. The biggest thing you need to remember here is inside this gas, the total pressure of that gas is going to be equal to the pressure of the gas that you collected, that you formed from the reaction, plus the pressure of the water vapor. Anytime you have water, a little bit of it will, will evaporate. That's called the vapor pressure. Um, and it depends on the temperature. They'll give you that typically. So if you, um, the total pressure is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure um, because the uh, the way that the tube is, the, it's open so that the water can move um, in or out into a container. Um, so it will make the total pressure equal to the atmospheric pressure, um, water vapor pressure. So you'll have to subtract atmospheric pressure minus the water vapor pressure will give you the pressure of the gas that you collected. Um, and then typically these tubes are graduated so you can measure the volume of the gas collected. And um, it's the same volume for the gas and for the water vapor because it takes up the space of its container. So really pay attention, this is Dalton's law. You definitely need to know that. Um, from there, once, you have, once you've done this, then you could use Pivnerch or whatever else the question's asking you about. Uh, Beer's law pops up all the time. There's um, one specific topic about it even. So remember in Beer's law, there's two phases. The first phase you need to construct a calibration curve. And the second phase is for testing, although that's usually pretty short. When you're doing your calibration curve, you want to make dilutions. And then you will plot absorbance uh, versus concentration. And when you do make your calibration curve, it should look something like this, where you have a low concentrations have closer to a zero absorbance, high concentrations have higher absorbance, because in your cuvette, the more things that can block the light, the less light can pass through, and we call that absorbance. Um, yes, so more absorbance, more concentrated, more things blocking light. From there, this line, and you should always use a line of best fit, but the equation of that line, uh, if you use y equals mx plus b format, b should be zero because you should have a zero absorbance when you have a zero concentration. Um, so y equals mx, y is your absorbance, um, x is your concentration, and m is uh, a combination of two things, your molar absorptivity constant, and your path length. And typically, we use cuvettes that are one centimeter in length, and so that makes it, um, this calculation much easier because you just plug in one for B, um, but then your molar absorptivity is the slope, and that's going to be different based on your spectrophotometer and what substance you're using and what wavelength you're testing it at. So it winds up being A equals EBC. This one you definitely need to know about errors. If you have too much water present in the cuvette or in your dilution, your um, absorbance measure will be too low. 
If you have smudges or fingerprints that block extra light, uh, your, your absorbance will be too high. Um, and that's for your calibration curve. Once you find the calibration curve and you have your equation of the line, the molar absorptivity constant, then you can test some other substance and see where on the line it fits. Um, so if you're doing like um, we did a blue dye and Gatorade. So once you do your known concentrations of blue dye, you could take the Gatorade, test the absorbance, maybe it's here, and you would see what is the concentration of blue dye in the Gatorade based on its absorbance. And so that's the essentials for Beer's Law. Another lab that you should know about is gravimetric analysis. I briefly talked about it before, but whenever you're forming a solid product, so you're doing some kind of reaction and you're forming um, a solid, the other thing should be aqueous, but you're solid. Whenever you have that solid substance being formed, you can filter it out, uh, typically using a filter paper, and you'll collect the aqueous thing down below like this. That's called gravimetric analysis because you're using gravity to separate the solid from the aqueous substance. A um, couple things you should know about this one is um, whenever you're doing this, you always filter, then you rinse the solid with additional water to make sure all of the aqueous stuff is dissolved and passed through the filter. Then you will dry it. And you always want to dry it to a constant mass to make sure that all of the water has evaporated out. So that's a really common error that we talk about with gravimetric analysis. Not all of the water has evaporated. Um, or maybe not all of the aqueous thing dissolved in water. Um, so you still have some of the additional compound on the top when you shouldn't have. Um, whatever passes through the filter is called the filtrate. And that's just so you know that term. And the solid is, of course, the precipitate. Let's talk about some of the really um, basics of titration first. So some titrations are just performed to find the concentration of an unknown substance. Um, so typically you'll have a burette and you'll have um, traditionally an Erlenmeyer flask because it has a, a narrow neck and you will slowly add the titrant, which you typically has the known concentration into the analyte which will have your unknown concentration. Occasionally you'll flip these two around, but that is pretty rare. Um, so then, because we're using the burette, we can measure exactly how much of the known solution it takes to completely react with the analyte. And then how do we know that it's complete? Well, we could use a pH indicator if you're doing an acid-base titration, um, or you could use another indicator, so like, um, if a typical one would be something like potassium permanganate reacting with hydrogen peroxide, that one pops up a lot because this is a very dark purple. And when they react, it forms a colorless solution. So um, just naturally, if you start seeing um, a very, very pale pink or purple uh, remaining, that means that all of the hydrogen peroxide has reacted. Um, so whatever uh, situation you have in that particular reaction, um, you'll be using different things to tell us when it has completely reacted. Now you need to pay attention to the stoichiometry, so um, like this reaction is not balanced. Um, let me do a simple one so you guys can see uh, we have something like H2SO4 reacting with uh, sodium hydroxide. We have two hydrogens and only one hydroxide, so I know it's going to take two of that compound to completely react um, and neutralize the H2SO4. Uh, so when you were to solve this, let's say I know this is a one molar solution and I don't know the concentration of the sulfuric acid, but I do know that I have uh, 50 milliliters of it. Let's say it took um, 150 milliliters of our one molar sodium hydroxide. What you can do is you would convert that to liters, 0.15 liters times the one molar will give us 0.15 moles of sodium hydroxide. You have to take into account the stoichiometry. There are two sodium hydroxides for every one sulfuric acid, H2SO4. 
So that means um, in my unknown, I have 0 0.075 moles of the H2SO4. From there, I can convert back into molarity using the volume uh, 0 0.05 liters. Remember, it needs to be in liters. And so it's 1.5 molar for the sulfuric acid. Um, so this is kind of the, the point for most um, straightforward titrations is to figure out the molarity of your analyte, your unknown solution. And so you would find moles of the titrant, the known solution, and use the mole ratio and then convert back into molarity of your unknown solution. You might be asked about um, an activity series um, type of reaction. Um, remember that single replacement reaction. So let's say I've got something like um, copper and aluminum chloride. Uh, this reaction will actually not happen. Um, aluminum is more reactive than copper, so the copper cannot replace the aluminum. So you won't see anything happen there. But if you have the reverse, if you have solid aluminum reacting with copper 2 chloride, uh, you will see a reaction. The aluminum is more reactive. It will replace and form aluminum chloride. You should balance that. But from here, if you were to do both of those reactions, you would be able to see that the one that has the solid metal replacing it, the one that reaction happens, that means that that solid metal is more reactive. So you could perform both of those things, or you could perform four, five, six reactions and use that information to determine what we call an activity series. The solid metal that reacts with the most substances is the most reactive, and the solid metal that reacts with the least things is the least reactive. So from there, you can kind of build what we call an activity series. Now, you might be asked about reactions involving the collision theory. So collision theory is for kinetics, for reaction rates, and there's three main things that you might um, be experimenting with. The first one would be temperature. Um, the second one would be concentration. And the third one would be surface area. And so you could be asked about measuring the rate of reaction for these three different scenarios. Higher temperatures will typically have a faster rate because there's more collisions, they're moving faster, greater kinetic energy. Um, for concentration, uh, the particles are much closer together at higher concentrations, so they're more likely to collide more frequently. So that increases the rate of the reaction. And the last one is surface area. You might be asked about like big chunks of the substance, the reactant, versus tiny pieces of the reactant. The tiny pieces of it, as long as they have the same mass, will have a faster rate of reaction because there's more places for collisions to occur. Um, so, again, there's very, a lot of various ways they could ask that question, but if you know um, the, how those three things affect the rate, then you should be able to answer it easily. Another kinetics lab that pops up sometimes is the rate law. Um, sometimes we use crystal violet, sometimes there's other reactants that could be there, um, but it all involves kind of the same process. Um, so crystal violet reacts with sodium hydroxide to form um, a colorless compound. So this is a dark purple, so it's called crystal violet. And so we can track the color change over time. Now typically you would use something like a spectrophotometer or a colorimeter to map to track that color change over time. And essentially you will then plot a concentration of the crystal violet over time, and it will decrease. Okay. Based on the order of the reaction, um, then you would test the other relationships. You would test um, a natural log of the concentration of your crystal violet over time, and you would test the um, one over the concentration of your crystal violet over time. Um, so if it was a first order reaction, you would see something like this. All right, and whichever one gives you the straight line um, is going to be the order for the reaction. Um, so in this scenario, uh, because the natural log of concentration versus time is your straight line graph, you know it's a first order reaction. Let's say in a different reaction, you wind up with a straight line for this one. Um, that this scenario, these three graphs would indicate that there would, it is a second order 
reaction. And then um, another scenario would be like this. If the concentration versus time graph is uh, your straight line graph, then you know the zero order. So essentially you're manipulating the data, creating those graphs, seeing which one is the um, straight line graph, and that gives you the order of the reaction in respect to that thing that's changing color. Um, very common kinetics lab uh, was is doing those relationships. Okay, um, calorimetry labs show up all the time. Remember, calorimetry labs typically will take place inside an insulated calorimeter. And so typically you'll have uh, an insulating container of some kind. It could be a styrofoam cup, could be nested cups, could be a bomb calorimeter, which is a sealed container. But no matter what, you're going to have your reaction occurring inside the calorimeter. You'll be measuring the temperature um, and you'll be measuring the temperature of the surroundings, change in temperature of the surroundings. So if the surroundings are increasing in temperature, it's an exothermic reaction. If your surroundings are decreasing in temperature, it's an endothermic reaction. I always think you can't put the thermometer in the molecules that are reacting themselves. Um, but once you figure that out, you'll be able to do Q equals MC delta T. And you should always use the, um, the total mass of the whole mixture, the specific heat of the whole mixture, um, which sometimes they'll just use the specific heat of water because if it's a water-based mixture, then um, it, will, it should be very close to the specific heat of water. And change in temperature, of course, is of the surroundings. And so that will give you your heat for that particular scenario. Very frequently, they'll have you change that to um, enthalpy. Enthalpy is given in kilojoules per mole. So a big mistake that I see is people just leave it in joules. Um, make sure that you pay attention to if it's asking for just heat or if it's asking for enthalpy of reaction, which in, in which case you want to divide by the moles of reaction. And the biggest uh, source of error for this experiment is heat loss to the surroundings. So if heat loss to the surroundings, like outside of the calorimeter, that means your temperature that you measure will be lower than expected and your heat measured will be lower than expected, typically. Now let's talk about heat of combustion labs. Um, heat of combustion labs, you'll typically have some kind of container with water in it, and you'll be measuring the temperature of the water, but you'll be burning something underneath the water. Um, and so whatever is burning will be releasing heat and sending it to the water. Again, a big source of error for this is heat loss to the surroundings, especially if you're not able to use an insulated container for this. Um, but uh, you're still going to use Q equals MC delta T. It just has a slightly different setup than your normal calorimetry labs. From there, of course, you would take um, your heat and convert that into kilojoules and then divide by the moles of the substance that was being burnt to get the heat of combustion. Now let's look at titrations in a little bit more detail when you're tracking the pH. If you're doing an acid-based titration and you're tracking the pH over time, you can create a titration curve or a pH curve. pH is on the y-axis and your volume of your titrant is on your y-axis. From there, you can create your titration curve, which would look like this. This would be a strong acid with a strong base. You're starting with a strong acid, adding strong base in slowly. Um, your volume at equivalence point is still used to find the concentration of the unknown. Um, but the pH at that equivalence point is 7 when they're both strong. And um, this would be the opposite. You're starting with a strong base, titrating in a strong acid. pH is still at 7, and the volume of your titrant is still used to calculate your concentration. You can get a little bit more information when you're doing a weak acid or weak base titration. So here you would have your equivalence point. Um, that's still used to find your concentration. The pH at equivalence point is going to be above 7 for a strong, I'm sorry, for a weak acid with a strong base. Um, but then you're at half equivalence point, so literally half the volume of, that it takes to get to equivalence point. At half equivalence point, pH is equal to the pKa and your um, amount of acid is equal to the amount of your oops, amount of acid is equal to the amount of your conjugate base. And from pKa you can convert that back to Ka.
um, when you have a weak base with a strong acid, it's the same thing just flipped. Equivalence point is still used to find the concentration of your known unknown. The pH at equivalence point is slightly below seven. Half equivalence point is so literally half the volume it takes to get to two equivalence point. Your pH is equal to your pKa. And from here, your concentration of your base is equal to your concentration of your conjugate base. Or conjugate acid, excuse me. Um, so yeah, so those are the extra information that you would get from doing a pH titration. Um, make sure that you know that um, if you're using an indicator for this, the indicator has to use just a little bit extra titrant to change color. So the indicator will typically change just past the equivalence point. And so that's an inherent uh, source of error when you're doing an indicator-based titration. But when you're able to track the pH like this, um, that helps to eliminate the error from the indicator. Okay, so now um, let's talk about voltaic cells. Uh, voltaic cell experiments, um, you'll have to have uh, two half cells. Occasionally, these are connected uh, with a porous barrier or porous membrane. So you'll just see one container with a porous membrane like that. Um, but it's the same idea. You'll have a salt bridge. The salt bridge balances the charge by transferring um, anions and cations. You'll also have the metal electrodes and a wire in between them. Typically, there's a voltmeter measures the voltage produced. Um, when you have um, your anode and your cathode, at the anode is oxidation, at the cathode is reduction, and um, oxidation is going to lose electrons, so electrons will transfer. Uh, make sure you know that it goes from the anode to the cathode for electrons, uh, and not just uh, left to right, because they could draw it in the opposite direction. Um, anions, negative charged ions will travel toward the anode, positive charged ions travel toward the cathode. Um, at the anode, because it's losing electrons, you will see that the metal electrode gets smaller over time because you're turning into more ions. The cathode, because you're gaining electrons, will actually get bigger over time because your ions are turning into solid substances. And so those are the questions that they are typically going to ask you about these um, experiments. They could also ask you about changes to standard conditions, um, which involves the Nernst equation. So your cell potential is equal to your standard cell potential uh, minus uh, RT over NF LNQ. Like that. So you could have a change in concentration, which changes Q. You could have a change in temperature, um, which changes uh, your conditions as well. So just be careful with the Nernst equation there. In the last experiment, we'll talk about our electrolytic cells. For electrolytic cells, you need to know that um, there's some kind of current applied for a certain amount of time. And so your equation is I equals Q over T. Um, or the way I like to remember it, amps is equal to coulombs per second. Uh, because if you know coulombs, we can use Faraday's constant. Faraday's constant is um, 96,485 coulombs. coulombs per mole of electrons. And when you know Faraday's constant, you can... Um, and the amps and the seconds, then you can convert to find the amount of solid um, produced over the course of your electrolysis. Um, let me give you an example. So let's say you're doing um, copper and we're going to produce solid copper from this. Uh, so it's a two electron process. I wanna know, okay, if I use uh, two amps for 60 seconds, how many grams of copper is produced? It won't be much, but um, very typical type of question. You would use the two amps times the 60 seconds. So 120 coulombs are formed or used rather. And then from there, I can use Faraday's constant, the 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. 
I'm going to scooch it down this way. I know that for every one reaction here, um, there are two electrons in the process. Uh, and I also know that for every uh, one copper that is reacted, I'm using the two electrons. So we'll go there. And copper's mass is 63.5 grams per mole. So the electrons cancel, the moles cancel, and our coulombs cancel out. So you would just multiply and divide, and you get uh, 0 0.039 grams of copper produced, um, which isn't bad considering this was just one minute. Um, but that's kind of your, your general structure for solving these types of reactions. They could ask you to work backwards, figure out how much time it would take to produce a certain amount. You would just do this in reverse, find out how many coulombs, and then um, use the amps equals coulombs per second to figure out how much time. Um, but yeah, those are uh, very typical electrolysis questions. Um, that would be asked when given an experiment like this.